Hey everybody, welcome to our series we're calling Good Grief. My name is Josh, I'm one of the pastors with Branch Life Church, and throughout this series, you'll hear from a variety of speakers who are going to talk to us about what we all experience as we travel through grief. Shock, anger, sadness, and acceptance. Our goal and our prayer is at the end of this series that you will be encouraged wherever you are in your season of grief and also be able to encourage others. So much so that in the end, you'll be able to say that it was good grief. I hope you'll stay to the very end of this teaching. I have some more information for you when we wrap things up. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope that you enjoy this teaching. Branch Life, really good to be here with you. I know that this series is kind of a heavy series in some ways, and so I appreciate the trust uh, that your pastors have extended, bringing in uh, guest speakers who they know and love and trust to be able to speak to you in the midst of kind of a heavy series. So thanks for that. Thanks for tuning in. For those of you who are online, appreciate it. Before we get started, I just want to touch base on, uh, with you about two things. First of all, <clears throat> I love Branch Life Church, and Josh said at the beginning uh, that I work with pastors and, and leaders in congregations around southeastern Pennsylvania through the ministry of Netzer, but because I'm working with pastors and churches all the time, when something cool is happening relative to all the things happening out there in the kingdom of God, I get to see it and be like, wow, that's really cool. And I just want you to know at Branch Life, God's done some really special things. Here's one of the special things that I love, is that when God designed us and when God created us, he created us for two main reasons. One is to be in relationship with him, to just love him, to enjoy God and to be connected to him. And the other thing that he created us for is that we would be like God's autobiography. That when we are living our lives, the way we relate to one another, the way we relate to the world around us, that people would be able to see and know and understand God through watching us. And when I look at Branch Life, the very first thing that comes to mind every time I think about Branch Life is how well this congregation has served this community. I think about that, it just pops up. I'm like, man, Branch Life loves the community that they're in and serves them well. And the second thing I think of is, man, that makes me think about how Jesus loved the world when he walked here. And so I just wanna say, God's doing really cool stuff in you guys and you are car carrying the character and revealing the nature of God in really cool ways. So kudos to that. That's God's work in you. I'm not trying to puff you up. I'm just trying to say you guys are awesome because God's at work in you, and it's a really cool thing to be a part of that. And the second thing I want to say is that a lot of the reason why that happens is also because God has called out leaders to help guide and direct you who want to lead you to Jesus, not just to themselves. You know, and, and when you have leaders who are humble, who say God's the one who's doing the work and we just want to stay connected with the Lord, that's an awesome thing. You guys already know this, but from another guy who works with pastors all the time, I just want to remind you, you have some really special pastors and you have a great pastoral team. And one of the things that's a, a bit of a challenge for pastors is to stand up in front of their congregation and say, hey, I need prayer you know, pray for me, because they're here to serve you, and they're, they're, their interest is not in receiving, their interest is shepherding, caring, giving. But it's also important that we as a congregation, we as a church, pray for our pastors. The scriptures call us to that. So since I'm an outside guy, it's easy for me to stand up here this morning and say, let's pray together for the pastors, and it gives you an opportunity to pray for the pastors. So as we get started this morning, uh, before we get into the word, I just want to take a minute to pray with you. So join me, please, in praying for the leaders here at the church. Father God, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for the gift, God, of your presence with 
with us. We thank you that you don't leave your church and say, hey, go figure it out and come back to me when you have the results I'm looking for. No, that's not the kind of God you are. You're the God who's with us in the trenches. You're with us through life. And you bring leaders alongside of us too, God, who allow us to experience the leadership of you and your spirit guiding us through the scriptures and guiding us through life. So this year, God, we just want to honor and bless the work that you've been doing at Branch Life. And then we all together want to pray for Josh and for his family and for Scott and for his family, for Alex, for his family, for all the leaders here, God, at Branch Life. We ask, God, that you would move in them because we know that as you continue to bless them in their own walk with you, that it will also continue to be a blessing to this church and this community. And as you bless this church and this community, it will pour out to become a blessing for the world around us. And so, God, again, we ask that even as these pastors walk through a season of grief themselves, as they've just lost a treasured, dear, loved one, one of the team, a father, a friend, one who's been so special in this community, in the midst of that grief, we ask that as deep as the grief goes, that even further, God, would be the experience of your presence. We ask, God, this year, we pray together that for these pastors and these leaders, that the pages of Scripture would come alive more than they ever have. That your spirit, the sense of your spirit with them would be so close to them and that they would experience the depth of your love for them in ways that are new and fresh in this year. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as you know, uh, we're in the grief series, and today, as Josh said, we're looking at the stage of anger, and these stages, you know, it's not from one to the next to the next. They kind of ebb and flow, and uh, some of us experience some of those stages more than others because of how we're wired. And uh, today, we're looking at anger, and some of us deal with anger more than others. Uh, the game plan for today is to start by looking just at the topic of anger itself and understanding how anger works in Scripture. And then we're going to transition into how anger acts as an expression of grief in the grieving process. And then the last thing that we're going to do is talk about how to meet God in the midst of our grief and is particularly in the anger stage of grief. Make sense? You with me? All right, cool. Here's the main point for today. The main point for today is that how we process our grief and our anger has the capacity to lead us closer to God or to allow us to experience more separation from God. So our relationship with God is affected personally by how we process this anger or grief. So today, if you want to, instead of weakening that sense of connection with God, you want to grow closer to God, then the idea is, God, help me to know how to process my grief and my anger in a way that draws me closer to you. Now, like I said, we all have anger in different ways. You know, some of us get more angry than others. Naturally, we're kind of naturally predisposed to that, as Josh said. I'm Irish, it is what it is, I'm a Birds fan, you know, it is what it is. I do have a green vest, I noticed that the uniform today was white and green, there was a lot of that going on, but I was getting a little warm, so I took off the green vest, but no, it's in my heart and it's bleeding out of me, right? Um, so we, here we are uh, dealing with this idea of anger, knowing that some of us in this room process anger in very acute ways, and some are a lot more chill. Think about when you were a kid. Maybe you didn't express anger, but you felt anger. Maybe you were the one who sat there and brooded on stuff and kind of held it in, you know, and it affected things around you, but you just kind of held it in. Or maybe you were the one who just generally your disposition was joy or you were a little more emotionally differentiated and things could happen and you would just roll with the punches and it wasn't a big deal. Third option, maybe you were Irish. And maybe you're like me. You were a straight up hothead who like, you know, had a hair trigger and your brother could just look at you sideways and it would set you off. All right, I'm getting awkwardly specific. I'm okay, seriously, I'm fine. Um, even though anger affects all of us, there is a sense in which we experience it on different levels. Even when we're experiencing the exact same experience, Many of us process that in different ways. And um, 
when we're dealing with anger, there's a couple things that I think it's important for us to, to remember in order to locate ourselves in the midst of our anger. And um, I think when you think about that first time that you're angry, um, fast forward that to how you live with anger today. And you may have matured and grown, but there's still part of that DNA of how you process in your life that still sits with you, right? I mean, that's still part of who you are. So think right now about the last time you got angry. Think about that. Just stop and think. When's the last time you got angry? And I know a bunch of you are looking at your spouses right now, but that wasn't what I asked you to do. Some of you, maybe I should be asking, like, how many of you are angry right now? Some of you are like, I'm so mad you're preaching this message, man. I know if you weren't mad most of this week, you were at least mad last Sunday as you watched a football game, and you're hoping not to be mad on Monday night. Um, Anger can go a couple of different ways. It can be a momentary experience that we have in reaction to something that's happening around us. Or it can be a growing volcano inside of us where the inferno starts to swell up. And we find in our lives that our patience is wearing thin and that we're beginning to react in certain ways and we're just hoping that it doesn't pop because we know if it pops that it could be a train wreck for ourselves and it can be really dangerous for the people around us. But here's what I want you to know about anger. Anger is not an ungodly emotion. It's not even an unhealthy emotion if it's processed the right way. And this is how we know it, because God gets angry. When we read the pages of Scripture, we realize God gets angry. That does not mean that God is an angry God. He's not an angry God. And sometimes we're tempted to see God as an angry God who's just like got that volcano inside of him, who's just waiting for us to mess up so he can smite us. You know, that's not an accurate picture of God from the Scriptures at all. What the Scriptures say is that God is slow to anger and he's rich in love. That his anger lasts only for a moment, but his favor lasts for a lifetime. This is the thing is that God's posture is a posture of love. He's a God of joy. He's a God of peace. But let me ask you, would you be okay with a God who never got angry? Because there's a lot of messed up things that happen in our world. When you're a kid, a little kid, and your brother or your sister does something to you that just really makes you mad, and you come to your parent, and you're like, they did this to me. What if your parent was like, ah, it's all good, no worries. You know, and your parents were always like that and never responded to your sibling like, hey, you can't do that. That would be a problem. A passive God who doesn't get frustrated with evil is a problem. See, anger is a natural response to evil and injustice. And if we never get angry about anything, we might have to ask ourselves the question, why don't I care about evil and injustice? Because God does. And even though he's in a posture of peace and in a posture of joy, when he sees people dealing with his kids in certain ways, or when he sees his kids dealing with each other in certain ways, and when he sees us walking away from things that are good for us, that's a frustrating thing for God because he loves us and he wants the best for us. But God knows how to process anger in really healthy ways. And a big part of the reason why God can process in healthy ways his anger is because he understands this, that time is a big factor in how we deal with anger. And let me explain what I mean. When you think about what God says about anger, again, one of those primary character qualities of God, one of the foundational ways that God's defined for us in Scripture is that he's slow to anger slow to anger. That's a function of time. He doesn't get there quick. The second thing about God is that his favor only lasts for, or his anger only lasts for a moment, which means he doesn't let it last very long. 
So he's slow to get angry, and then once he's angry, he deals with it quickly, and he doesn't let it last long. This is what we've also been called to in Ephesians chapter 4. That's the, the, the scripture that's all about how the body of Christ relates to one another. And so if you read this, it says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, when we're all interconnected in the body of Christ, we don't lie to each other. We're not just wearing a mask and being fake with each other. Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. So be honest. If we have a problem, if there's anger, if there's struggles, we got to be honest with one another. For we're members of one another. That's what we're doing with anger. So it says, be angry. That's a command. Be angry and do not sin. So be angry when things are inappropriate, but do it in the right way. Sin is that which separates us from God. Remember what our big idea was? How we process our anger and our grief? It can either draw us deeper in our relationship with God and bring us closer, or we can become more distant. And so here it says, do not sin. Do not let the anger affect us in a way that draws away from God or separates us from other people. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. That's a function of time, isn't it? So how we deal with our anger is held within time. And do not give the, uh, an opportunity to the devil. In other words, if the way I process the feelings of anger is not within the right time frames, it'll give opportunity for the devil to mess with me. And we don't want the devil to mess with us. I don't want the devil to mess with me personally, and I don't want the devil to mess with the family of God. So in order to process anger appropriately, I need to be like God. James tells us that we're called to be slow to anger and quick to listen. And Paul tells us here that we're to be angry and to not sin, which means don't let the anger last more than a day. So when we are angry really quickly... When we respond to our anger really quickly, what happens? A couple of things happen. One is we get embarrassed. Because I don't know about you, but there's definitely been moments when I've spoken out of anger, when I haven't just slowed down and processed that anger, but I've just spoken what came to mind. There's been many a times on a ball field or, you know, on a basketball court or wherever, where I'm just like, bam, you know, I'm in the competition mode. How many of you, I won't ask for a raise of hands, have been on the road another place where you can get angry really quickly because someone got you to the mall less than a half of a second later than you wanted to be there? And so that person, how dare they steal that half a second from me? You know, that sort of anger, when we respond quickly, the first thing is, is it can be embarrassing and damaging but the second thing is it feeds a pattern of behavior that we do not want to feed. Because behavioral patterns are formed like addictions are formed. And behavioral patterns are formed the way that good routines of discipline in our life are formed. They're formed through regular practice of self-discipline or regular practice of a lack of self-discipline. And whether we form good behaviors or bad behaviors is about how we consistently respond. And when we have anger rise up in us and we're quick to respond to that, we begin to for form a behavioral pattern that says, when I feel this way, I'm going to react this way. And the devil knows how to exploit that. And so does my big brother. When I was a little kid, not anymore. I got bigger than him. So we don't have that problem. Yeah, amen, yeah. That's what happens when we deal with anger too quickly. But when we don't deal with anger quick enough, it's another issue. So God is slow to anger, and his anger only lasts a moment. So there's this whole thing about the, the parameters around anger that are really important. I... Um, I remember uh, this, I was at a pastor's conference up at Brooklyn Tabernacle, and Pastor Simbola, Jim Simbola, who's the pastor up there, he said something to us as pastors. He said, hey, what you don't deal with, you will deal with. And then he just sat there for, like, I think it was like 10 seconds. He just sat there in complete silence after he said it, which is a long time when you're speaking. What you don't deal with, you will deal with. And then... Would you rather deal with it on your terms 
or would you rather deal with it when it just comes up in the most inappropriate time? So pastor, whatever it is that you need to deal with in your church, go and deal with it, right? Same thing for us in our personal lives. When we have anger and we choose, I'm going to wait for another time to deal with that, or I'm just going to stuff it and deny it and pretend it's not there, it will come up. And so on one level, we can't be quick with our anger, and on another level, we can't just deny that our anger is there. We can't wait too long. An important part of anger is recognizing that it's actually an indicator of other things that are going on in our life. Most of the time, our anger is not congruent with our circumstances. Most of the time when we experience anger, we are experiencing emotions that are not equal to the experience that we're having around us, the, the circumstances around us. So it's a wonderful opportunity that is in our, uh, there's a, a great reminder for us, this wonderful opportunity when I experience that to ask the Lord, what is going on in my life? Why am I experiencing this? Because anger is an iceberg emotion. It's an above-the-surface emotion. So what we're seeing and feeling is the anger, but underneath of it is all the other things that we may be feeling that we haven't come to terms with yet. Or it's a downhill emotion. So let's talk about this. Anger is the feeling of displeasure or annoyance, sometimes the feeling of hostility. And it's a secondary emotion and that secondary emotion can be masking other emotions. And those emotions can be emotions such as fear, uncertainty, jealousy, stress, embarrassment, pain, or our topic for today and in this series, grief. So when we're feeling fear, we may react in anger because we're scared of something being taken from us. When we feel embarrassed, have you ever been in that spot where you feel embarrassed and then you just get mad because you're embarrassed? You know, and so many, or, or we're sad, lost, and we don't know how to deal with it. And that's what we're talking about. So grief, on the other hand, as defined by Jim last week, is this, an acute and natural pain in response to loss. So anytime we experience loss, we experience pain as related to that loss. And that's what grief is. And a reminder that grief is not just for those of us who are losing loved ones to physical death. And it's very much for them, but it's also for the rest of us, we experience grief and loss in so many ways, right? And so there's a lot of things that we lose. Sometimes we've been betrayed by a friend and the trust that we had is lost now, and that's grievous. Sometimes we had a community of people that we were really connected to, and then we had moved out of the area or something happened with the friend group, and that's just a deep loss for us. Some of us had a vision of things that we were going after, a business that we were starting or something we wanted to do with our family and it hasn't worked out but we had our hopes set on that thing and we have to release it it's the death of a vision and that can be a really painful thing it could be the loss of an ability or a capacity you know maybe you received an injury or you got sick or you just started to age and you can't do things that you loved to do before that can be a really painful thing for people maybe you had a job that you loved and now you don't have that job anymore and you lost your job. Or you used to have a, a certain amount of resources and now you don't have those resources anymore. Any of those things can be a place of loss. One of the big ones, I think, is for people when they've had a, a season of life that they've really treasured. And then it goes missing. You know, like we have a, our oldest son just went off to college, you know, and it's like, Ooh, okay. And our youngest one is going to college next year. And I'm like, you know, let's... Let's have a party. And my wife is like, let's have a grieving session. You know, and no, we both grieve, you know, over that. And we both celebrate the new season of life. But there's a season that when it's gone, you look back and you're like, man, I miss that season. You know, I miss that season of life. There's one thing that the scriptures are completely clear that we should grieve. Anybody know what that is? We should grieve our sin. We should lament our sin. We should look at what were the things that we've done that aren't the way that God designed it, and it should break our hearts. It's supposed to. The Bible tells us when we look at our sin to grieve, mourn, and wail, to turn our joy into grief when it comes to our sin. 
that we're not supposed to just keep going, ah, it's fine, you know. We know that we can be forgiven by God and set free from shame, but initially when we look at what we've done, it should be grievous to us, and then we bring that to the Lord who's capable of forgiving it. So I want you to stop for just a second and think about, again, where is the moment where you have experienced grief lately? I asked you before to think about where you were angry. Now I want you to think about, of all of those kinds of things, where are the places where you're experiencing grief and loss? Not just the loss of loved ones, although the loss of loved ones, but in any of these places, where have you in recent history experienced grief and loss? You may find yourself in the anger stage of grief if you're experiencing that you have a low bandwidth and a low tolerance for annoying things. Not if you always have had that. I mean that it's different than normal, you know? And if you find yourself more irritated than normal, if you find yourself in kind of a cynical place where you're having a really hard time having hope and having faith, Maybe in your mind the thoughts are about blame game where you're blaming yourself or you're blaming others for the loss that you're experiencing. Maybe you're obsessing on what's fair and what's not fair and you're frustrated about the lack of understanding. Maybe you even experience physical pains of you're having headaches and you're experiencing stress and you have high blood pressure and maybe you find it hard to really process and have good judgment right now. Any of those are signs that you might be in the anger stage of grief. Human emotions are not things that are simple. So when I'm experiencing anger or when I'm experiencing grief or when I'm experiencing fear, lots of times they're really kind of twisted together, right? That it's not easy to just nuance them. But in recent history, it's become more popular and more acceptable in our culture to actually talk about our emotions. There's always been novels and stories that have emotion all wrapped up in them, and we enjoy the story because it captures us on an emotional level. But in recent years, we've talked more directly about emotion and the different kinds of emotion. And so there's been a lot of books about emotion, and there's been more films about emotion. And that's even trickled down into animated films. Anybody ever see Inside Out? You know, that Inside Out where each emotion has its own little character and everything. This is a wonderful little uh, portrait of how the emotions work internally. There's another animated film by DreamWorks, which I, which I didn't think was anywhere near as good as Inside Out, but it has an important point that I want to make here. And it's the, in 2015, I think it came out it was from dreamworks it was the story home and it was where aliens invaded earth and there's this little girl i think her name's tip like a she's like a middle schooler or something like that i don't know like a preteen and she, i think her mom gets abducted by the bad aliens that are coming in or something and she's trying to figure it out she's alone and she's trying to find her way and she's dealing with deep loss and she's confused and she's scared. And then there's this other little alien that comes that's not one of the bad guys. I think they, his alien world has also been affected by these bad guy aliens. And his name's O. And they kind of team up, O and Tip. And she leaves, uh, uh, she's left alone. Tip is left alone at one point because O's going to find some stuff that they need. But she's left alone too long. And when O comes back, she's mad. She's furious. And she starts going off on O. She's letting him have it. And O's trying to figure this out. She's trying to compute what's going on. And he's like, wait a minute. Why are you so mad, you know? And she starts talking about all the things that have just happened to her with the loss of her mom and the loss of her home. And he said, it seems like those are things that should make you sad. But instead, you're mad at me. And she said, well, sometimes it's both. And he said, oh, you're sad mad. Yes, and that's where we find ourselves in the anger stage of grief, is sad mad. How many of us have ever been sad about stuff, but it's given us that short response? We just don't have any tolerance for stuff right now. But really underneath the iceberg, the visible part of it, is deep, deep grief and loss. C.S. Lewis explored this deeply. When he was earlier in his career, he wrote Surprised by Joy, which was kind of an intellectual take on how God, how we deal with the problem of evil and struggle and suffering. And it was very much like an academic book. And then he lost his dear wife, Joy. 
And after he lost her, all the intellectual stuff, you know, it kind of gets put to the side because now he's feeling it. And at that point, his journals start to fill up with all sorts of things about God. And some of them are not too pleasant. C.S. Lewis starts saying, what are you, God? Are you just a cosmic sadist who likes seeing us in pain? You have the ability, you have all the control, all the power, and yet you let us experience this. Maybe we're just lab rats and you're, you know, you're just having experiments with us. Later, C.S. Lewis reflects on those days and he writes an amazing book called A Grief Observed, a phenomenal read. But he says this, he says, all that stuff about the cosmic sadist was not so much the expression of thought as of hatred. Hear that for a second. What C.S. Lewis is saying in this moment is he says, he's the writer, you know, the intellectual. And he's saying, but what I was writing was, an expression, it was not an expression of what I was actually thinking. It was an expression of what I was feeling. And what I was feeling was hatred. You know where C.S. Lewis was from, right? He's Irish. Yeah. I was getting from it all the pleasure, the only pleasure a man can, in anguish can get, the pleasure of hitting back. It was really just telling God what I thought of him. And of course, as in all abusive language, what I thought didn't mean what I thought true, only what I thought would offend him and his worshipers most. He was responding, he was reacting in anger. That sort of thing is never said without some pleasure. It gets it off your chest. You feel good for a moment, but in the end, it misses its mark. And this is the thing that C.S. Lewis understood, is he understood that there are healthy ways and unhealthy ways of processing anger. And initially, what he did should be accepted by us as a just flat-out beautiful way of processing anger, going to God going to God with it. Now, I want to talk about three things here that we can do with anger. Two of them, not a great way to process. One of them, a great way to process. Remember our big idea for today? That how we process our grief and our anger can draw us closer to God or can create more distance in the relationship with God. So here's the three ways when we think about processing our grief and anger. The first one is this, is that when we deny our grief and our anger, what that does is ultimately leads to a place where it will affect us in ways that are harmful to us and are harmful to others. Secondly, when we're self-indulgent in our expressions of anger, when it just feels good to let it rip on someone, that damages relationships and it damages relationship with God. Not because God can't handle it, but because we're stepping into sin, separating ourselves from the way that God would have us live. And then the third option for us is the option that I want to invite us into today. And that option is that we would bring our anger directly to God. And when we bring our anger directly to God, what it does is it fosters intimacy with God. He's hearing and feeling our deep and innermost thoughts. And you know the person you go to when you have something happen to you, the first person you call, the first person you text, you're forming a bond with that person by taking the, the deepest and most important things to you and they're the first ones you share it with, the first fruits of your communication. And God wants to be that person for you. And it forms deep intimacy and trust with God when you do that. And secondly, God's the one who can bring healing to our life. Many others can try. But ultimately, God's the only one who can bring healing. If you have a hard time identifying your emotions or expressing your emotions, God has helped us with that by giving us King David, who was a guy who was crazy emotional, deeply emotional. When he sees Goliath talking bad about God, he's like, who do you think you are? Who is this? You know, such a, a righteous anger. God's anger in him. And then when he experiences loss and grief, he pours his heart out to God. And in the Psalms, there's these two different categories of Psalms. One's called the imprecatory Psalms, and they're the angry Psalms. And if you just Google imprecatory Psalms, it'll lead you to Psalms that'll show you how to express your anger with God. And then there's the Psalms of lament. 
And these are where there's just deep grief and he's pouring out his heart and sorrow to God. And I'd invite you to use those if you need those. They're guides for you when it comes to expressing those emotions to God. To do this, it requires slowing down. Being honest about our emotions, identifying them and processing them well cannot happen on the fly going a million miles an hour. And so I just want to invite you to carve out space in your life. If you're like, hey, I'm not dealing with grief or anger at all, maybe. But have you actually asked God to help you identify? Because maybe you are. And so what I want to invite you to do is to carve out space where you're going to sit with God and you're going to ask him, help me to identify places where I have lost things and how I feel about that and how that's affected me. When we bring those feelings of anger to God, what it helps us do is it helps us vet the places where we are actually angry at God or toward God, and then it can transition us to a place where we're angry alongside of God and with God. Because remember, God also gets angry. Have you ever had a friend who got upset about something that happened to you, and it felt good because you weren't the only one who was upset, but they were upset about it too? Or when you were losing something that was really important to you and you were grieving it, that you realized, oh man, that friend actually is really feeling my pain with me. This is what it means to carry one another's burdens. I had this experience when Jen and I were first married. Um, we had only been married a brief period of time and um, we moved out to, to Lebanon, Pennsylvania to help out with a church plant that was out there. This was my first time, first full-time gig in ministry and I was an intern as a part of this church plant and I was making like peanuts for money, you know, and uh, I didn't care because I was in ministry. Jen was driving a long way to work, living in another person's house because there was so little money in the church plant because church planters don't have that much money that they wanted to have us come and the church planter said why don't you just come and live in our house so we we're like all right whatever it takes so we lived in their house and we had two rooms in the house they had adult children in the house and there was only one bathroom in the whole house it was a mess i don't know why my wife stayed with me no idea not even a clue she's like way better than me anyway so i, I like we were sitting in this moment. I was so excited about the ministry, and we we're sitting in this moment that was kind of awkward with where we're living, and we get the terrible news that Jen's mom, who was in her 50s, had cancer and had cancer badly. Um, and in that moment, you know, I grew up in a church that um, we didn't get like real down when it came to like expecting big healings and all of that, but this is what we did, is when people were in need, we would pray for him. And sometimes when we prayed for him, we'd see God do amazing things. And there was times where I remember as a kid watching, uh, I, I remember this one uh, woman in particular, she was a teenager with leukemia and the church prayed for her and she was healed. You know, and, and God took away her cancer. And so in this moment, when we're in, in, living in this house and find out that Jen's mom has cancer, I'm like, I'm going to war in faith and I'm going to start praying and we're going to see Doris healed. And so we start praying and praying that, that God would heal her. And four months later, she died. And I didn't know what to do with that. I wanted to protect my wife from pain. I was so happy to be a part of this family and just getting to know Doris. And so one morning, it, we had these two rooms in the house, and it was real early in the morning, very dark, and Jen was still asleep. And I went over into the other room that was a little sitting room, and I sat there with all the lights off, and I was like, God, what are you doing right now? Like, do you feel this? I mean, we're giving our lives to you, and we're like living like crazy right now, and why would we experience this pain in the middle of this? And then I just, just said, how does this make you feel, God? Like, how are you feeling about this? And what I expected, I, in my imagination, what I expected to see was I expected to see God embracing Doris, receiving joy in the midst of our pain and telling us, don't worry about it, in time it's going to be fine. But interestingly enough, my imagination took me to a very different place that I wasn't expecting. As I said, God, how do you feel about this? I saw this picture in my mind of God shaking with rage and pouring tears in grief. And it shocked me. 
And I remember stopping and thinking, could God possibly actually feel that way? Because isn't God kind of above it and he knows the whole story so he doesn't get affected that way? But in the story that Josh read for us about Lazarus and Mary and Martha this morning, there's this moment where it says that Mary came to him and Mary says, if you had only been here, my, my, son, my, my brother wouldn't have died. That's sad mad. And everyone else around was like, couldn't this guy who's been healing everyone saved his friend? That's sad mad. And the response of Jesus is really interesting. In two verses, in verse, 30, uh, verse 33 and in verse 38, the way he responds is this. It says that he was deeply moved and troubled. And that deeply moved, the, the Greek word underneath of that, what it means is indignant. And when, and when uh, Tim Keller talks about this passage, what he says is Jesus was snorting with anger. And what was he angry at? He wasn't angry at Mary or at Martha or the people who were grieving. Remember, he's the one who created the world. He is the word of God. And all things exist by him and for him. He's the firstborn. He's the word of God. And the word became flesh. So the one who was standing there with Mary is the one who said, let there be light, who brought us into being and designed us for those two things, to be in relationship with him and relationship with other, each other in a way that reveals him. And in this moment, why does Jesus get angry? Because he did not design separation and death. He designed us to be in eternal relationship with God, with him, and with one another. And he is angry because of death. He is angry because of sin. He's angry because of the lies of the devil. In fact, so angry that he leaves heaven to do something about it. And so this is the moment in Jesus' ministry. He's healed people. He's raised them from the dead. But this is Jesus' coming out party. He's letting everyone know. He's putting the devil on notice. And he's not hiding and he's not saying be quiet about it. He yells at the top of his voice, Lazarus, come out. And he's conquering sin, death, and the grave. And what he's doing is making his way to the cross where he'll take all of our grief, all of our sorrows, all of our pain, and by his stripes, we will be healed. He's not a cosmic sadist. He's not a God who's passively sitting back, doing nothing about our pain. He's a God who comes from heaven to meet us in the midst of our self-inflicted pain and to rescue us, to go into the grave with us in order to raise us up. So branch life, brother, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. So we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. When you are angry, when you are in grief, know that you are not alone. Bring it to the one who joins you in your anger. Join him in his grief and know that he is not standing back doing nothing. He is not helpless and neither are we. He will join us. We will find him in the midst of our pain because we have a great hope and that hope has a name and his name is Jesus. Let's pray. You have been faithful to us, God. Help us to trust you enough to be terribly honest with you. God, help us to be frightfully honest with you. I ask that each person here today, that we would begin to express trust to you in the midst of grief, in the midst of anger, by opening up the pages of our journal, by going into our prayer closet and speaking out loud and telling you exactly how we feel, processing with you. And then may we remember that the devil who spins his lies, that death that has gripped us and separated us now has no victory. It has no claim because you have put on display for all to see that the devil is not the great victor in the cosmos, that at the end of the day, you will find and restore us in all ways to yourself and to one another. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Hey guys, thank you for listening through today's teaching. And I want to say a special thank you to our guest speakers who have helped us during this Good Grief series. I hope that they've helped you. If there's anything that we can do to support you in your journey and in this chapter of life, please don't hesitate to reach out. As a matter of fact, we'd love to hear from everyone who's watching this video. Go to branchlife.church and under the links section, you'll see our weekly check-in. Use that link to communicate with us. Again, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to pray for you and we'd love to connect and help you any way that we can through this chapter of life. We hope you'll join us next time. Thanks for being a part of this time. Have a great rest of your day.